Welcome everyone, Kostin here on Serious Gaming with a beginner's guide for a Total War Saga Troy, especially if you're a completely new player to the Total War series, which I imagine quite a few of you are, because this game was free for the first 24 hours on the Epic Game Store. Total War Saga Troy, though, is probably one of the more complex Total War games out there, especially when it comes to diplomacy and when it comes to the economy. On top of that, you also have plenty of unique campaign mechanics to deal with dependent on which character you're playing as. Now, when you pick up the game, there are two things you may want to do right off the bat. To play these two uh, tutorial battles to get an idea for how to handle battle uh, battles in this series. And also in the campaign, you may also want to play the tutorial mode legendary. campaign for Agamemnon. But you may not want to play Agamemnon if you're starting a new campaign campaign as a completely fresh player in a normal campaign. The tutorial campaign has basi is basically a special campaign where the AI is very passive and mechanics get introduced uh, gradually so you can get used to them. So it can be useful from that perspective, but it's obviously not a proper campaign and I don't think you can even complete it fully. I, I mean, I got I personally got to a point when I where I couldn't progress past um, with uh, at least his epic uh, mission chain. And since you have to complete that mission chain to win, uh, to win the Homeric victory, then yeah, that made things, uh, that made things uh, complicated. And then also his victory conditions are can also be annoying to deal with, like maintaining at least sixty percent uh, a key and influence in all of these uh, regions. Now, when it comes to picking a character to play as, there are a couple of things you need to worry about. And don't judge it based on what the game is saying is a normal, easy, hard, or normal starting situation for these characters, because the game, Creative Assembly, it doesn't know what it's doing when it comes to that. It's like, let's take a look at Achilles, he, who is supposedly Never normal. He starts battle. closest to Troy of all the Achaean factions. He starts surrounded by enemies, like all of these factions, Phasalia, uh, you have the Aeolians, you have uh, the Mi Mines, you have um, the Lops, you have all of these factions, you have plenty of factions to north, west, south, that don't particularly like you, and the AI is predisposed to go against you as a player, regardless of which faction uh, you're playing as, with perhaps the exception of easy difficulty, where that might not be the case as much, but still, the AI is predisposed to attack the player, and on top of that, Troy will almost certainly declare war against the Kians, including you, and you're the one closest to them. On top of that, it's also his campaign mechanics. Beyond his geographic and diplomatic situation at the start of the game, that makes it very hard, it's also his campaign mechanics. So Achilles is one of the harder characters to play on campaign mechanics alone. He has basically mood swings, because he's an angsty teenager. He should be very young, by the way, at the start of the Trojan War. He certainly doesn't look the part, but he should be very young at the start of the Trojan War, and he acts like an angsty teenager. So he can be outraged, grieving, uh, indignant. And each of these gives you significant bonuses, but also significant negatives. So for instance, if you're outraged, as an example, you have stronger armies, but your economy goes down by about 30%. You're gaining 30% less resources. Now, you can manage that quite well, in fact, uh, if you know what you're doing, but it is something uh, for better players. In fact, Achilles, because of his starting position, because of the mechanics he has to deal with, because he's isolated from friends, he's probably the hardest faction to play in the entire game, even for veteran players, let alone for new ones. So not him. What about Agamemnon? Well. Agamemnon is more of a case where you need to know what you're doing in terms of diplomacy and economy to really take advantage of him. And this goes for other factions as well, like having an idea how to play the series, having an idea of the diplomatic, um, um, of the, the diplomacy system, of the economic system, of the ways you can cheese it, can really help you out in a major way with some of these factions. Agamemnon is a faction that can be swarmed by all the enemies he has, but he can also become a powerhouse. Odysseus, he has just some annoying mechanics and an uh, army that requires experience to really get a handle on. If you want to play as one of the Kian factions as completely fresh players, you can go with no Menelaus. He I has a, an isolate, a more isolated position, not quite as isolated as Odysseus. That's one of his uh, Odysseus's main advantage. He's very far away from the front line, so to speak. 
uh, Menelaus is closer, but he won't be targeted by enemies directly. He can expand freely, dealing with minor factions along the way. He can go then go to the east. Like, he can go south to Crete, then go to the east in Anatolia, and then march on Troy from there. Like, he gets a lot of flexibility. He can recruit the units uh, from, all, from his allies, not just his own buildings. Uh, he basically gets global recruitment, if you've played... For those of you that have played Warhammer 2, only he has global recruitment, so you can recruit units in any province, uh, though with a higher cost and it takes longer. And he can also set up colonies without uh, an, an army cost. Like when you set up, when you resettle, raise settlements or abandon settlements, uh, generally cost you troops, but not for him. So he can be easy to play as. He can have a versatile army, he can have a powerful army. And he doesn't have major foes to deal with. But the easiest faction, and probably the most comfortable to play for new players, is likely Sarpedon. Now, you can play as Aeneas. He's not too bad either. Paris and Hector I would not recommend because Paris and Hector... The Hector has to build a major military alliance with various factions, so he has to deal with a lot of diplomacy. And Total War diplomacy is, let's say, mediocre at best. Uh, out, outrageously bad at worst and then Paris has to deal with Helen and the mechanic which Paris is kind of similar in Achilles in, in that sense so like he and Helen have mood swings or Helen has has mood swings if they're separated so that can be an issue so you have to really deal with uh, with that if you're playing as Paris and then you have Prime Zero so you have to you're basically in a contest if you're playing Hector uh, or Paris against each other right to become the heir of Troy in Prime's eyes. So that can be difficult to really get the handle on. The faction recommended, like Aeneas is fine, he doesn't have to get involved in that nonsense, but really the faction that would have the easiest time at the start of the game would be Sarpedon. They start isolated in the far east of the map. They have plenty of factions that are interested in friendly relations with them, uh, and factions that they get involved in a war against, they're not too hard to deal with either. And on top of that, they are an economic powerhouse and a military powerhouse. They have chariots from the very start of the game. They have special chariots, the Lycian winged chariots, and he also has a personal ch battle speed bonus to chariots and a diplomatic bonus. So he's certainly, as far as I see it, the easiest faction. He's not as simple as Menelaus, but he is, Sarpedon is certainly as far as I see it, the most powerful faction in the game to play as, and the easiest faction to play as in the game. Maybe Agamemnon could become more powerful, though I would certainly doubt that. The Trojans are more powerful than the Achaeans, by the way, and more unified than the Achaeans, so playing Sarpedon. one of them is certainly Long easy. ago, uh, your easier. people were banished now, when it comes to... By the forefathers when it comes to dealing with... Um, with the campaign, the right? So you'll start in something similar like this, regardless of what faction you will have. You'll have a minor settlement, a major settlement, an army with a mix of crap units and decent units, and then you'll have an opposing army right against you. You'll, you may also have certain agreements made, then you'll have different research um, unlocked depending on which faction you will go for. The research, let's start talking about that first because this is one of the things you will have to worry about. The research will, uh, the research you'll start with will give you some economic bonuses. So for instance, Sarpedon starts with a treasure hole and royal bronze. So he'll get 90 bronze per turn faction wide and 20 gold per turn. One of the things you may want to do early on is get royal granaries, royal timber, royal stone, basically get all of these. Gold is not so important early on, but food uh, and wood certainly are. Like if you want to prioritize something I'd, I'd prioritize food and wood get those and then stone because you're going to need the those for uh, for buildings this brings me to another point like beyond that in terms of research you may want song uh, songs of the age and then you may want people's feast Th these give you influence and happiness which i'll talk about another good um research that you might want to go for are marching drills which five percent campaign movement range for all armies and then potentially rationing, minus 10% upkeep for all units. Beyond that, it's personal choice. Like there, There's plenty of benefits to go for. Uh, some very expensive research that gives you more resources every turn, some other benefits that you can get.
but like for the start for a fresh player like just worry about getting the research uh trees and then getting uh, benefits not to your army per se doesn't matter which difficulty you're playing on the way i'm viewing it it's better to get campaign movement speed or get upkeep or both that's what i personally prioritize can be expensive can take a while so that's what you have to deal with when it comes to research. When it comes to resources, let's talk about that because this is the only Total War game with multiple resource types. Uh, you have food, wood, a stone, bronze, and gold. Gold is an unlimited supply, though there are certain buildings which will give you an infinite supply, but on the campaign map, gold is limited. There are certain gold mines uh, which some people can get access to very early on. Like That's one of the benefits, by the way, of Menelaus. There is a gold mine here in Crete and he starts over here he can easily hop over get that gold mine and have a good supply of gold from the start which is something some other factions may struggle it, uh, struggle with and having a large amount I of gold can benefit uh, benefit immensely Lord Troy will also Lord. generate gold and some other settlements will also generate gold gold is a pretty precious uh, resource uh, to acquire but food, wood, uh, food and bronze, and to an extent gold, are used for recruiting units and maintaining them. Wood applies to chariots. So, for instance, as Sarpedon, you can recruit chariots uh, from the start. And certain chariots, like the, the chariots you can recruit from the start, they don't, um, they don't cost uh, wood. But regular chariots would absolutely... Uh, cost with like for instance here 800 wood for the heavy Lycian uh, chariots as an example but not the ones that uh, you can recruit from the start these cost gold units will generally require uh, will cost either food or bronze or some gold uh, Achilles has pretty expensive units when it comes to gold uh, chariots will cost wood and most of the time what they'll require in terms of upkeep is food or bronze that's what you have to deal with when it comes to buildings to making buildings you will need wood and stone for the most part some buildings may require gold um, uh, some buildings some special buildings may require gold like for instance caravan station here a special building does require gold i think it's really only the special buildings or you know some other building like for instance a large mountain uh would cost gold quite a bit of it 300 gold uh but for the most part it's wood Honor and stone but some duty. some high tier buildings may actually cost gold as well temples also high level temples also cost gold uh and they can they also cost gold to rededicate this brings me to religion when it comes to religion you can only build one shrine one altar then sanctuary then temple one of these for each province so per, one for each god for provinces so, so you can only have one altar or sanctuary or temple right and then you can rededicate it though rededicating is expensive and costs gold each of these gives you various bonuses and also increases uh also increases your favor with a particular god though the gods are fickle and they constantly need uh need you to work with them the gods give you sign uh, various bonuses what you go for this is something you need to figure out on your own like what do you want what what are the bonuses that you care about what are the benefits that you want to go for for instance in this particular case since i will be fighting i could go for crete and see i could expand on sea i might want to go poseidon poseidon will give me a campaign movement range at sea minus two enemy siege all out, so he helps you with sieges and if you pray to him and this is temporary just keep in mind this uh, if you pray to a god, they will also give you a certain temporary buff. This costs gold and food uh, if you pray to a god. So each of these gods has various temporary bonuses. For instance, Aphrodite is growth and happiness. Poseidon is deep sea attrition. Athena is recruit to all ranks. All of the gods are useful. The ones you want to prioritize are dependent on your immediate concerns. You can also sacrifice to the gods, the Hecatomb, basically a bull sacrifice. If you sacrifice to a god, and this gets more expensive if you build temples and all that kind of stuff. If you sacrifice to a god, uh, you will gain favor with them. So, for instance, if I sacrifice, let's say, if I sacrifice with to uh, Aphrodite, right? 
I spend 500 resources, I get 70 favor, I get her respected. And now I have 10 diplomatic relations with all factions and 200% to all effects of organized games commandment faction wide. Now, here's one thing to understand about religion though. Without a temple, favor of the gods will disappear very, very quickly, very swiftly. So you really want a temple if you want the favor of God, like maybe you want to pray to get some temporary benefit, but if you really want to keep the favor of God, you will need temples. And I just want temples, especially if you want to get a high favor with the gods, get like worshiped. She would, if she's worshiped, she gives you a satyr, she gives you damage resistance, she gives a minus 30% success chance of enemy agents uh, on your own characters. Okay. So you'll also start with one major settlement, one resource settlement. Now resource settlements, pretty, pretty self-exploratory. They're, they're minor settlements where you can get some buildings all the way to rank three, because that's how far you can get them. Like you can get them to rank three. You can get special buildings or military buildings uh, all the way to rank three. So you can't get the highest level there, but you can also get resource buildings. So for instance, I, so for instance, Kalinda is a stone settlement, right? To collect stone. And when it comes to resource collection, uh, regardless of which resource you're talking about, you will have these five building types. The first one is basically just going to give you some resources, a uh, small amount of resources. The second one gives you slightly more, but also construction time benefit, but at the cost of influence. The third one increases all resource gained in the province. Uh, this is useful for a larger province, especially if you have you know, a lot of food or bronze or wood. Uh, the fourth one is an expensive building, but gives you a truckload more resource, a res uh, amount of resources. And the fifth one gives you a large amount of resources, but costs you growth. Generally, you want to go for the first one. And if you don't care about growth, you can go for the fifth one. The second, third, and fourth, well, that depends if you can afford them, if you're willing to pay, pay the price. Like either the huge cost of resources, the, the happiness uh, debuff, uh, the influence debuff. Like there is a cost to all of this. But if you just want some resource like stone miner tents, in this example, I can just go that. Secondly, you can get, uh, for instance, you can get some buildings, like some buildings, you, some military buildings, you might only want to build a minor settlement. So for instance, the watchtower patrols, they give you some benefits. You might want to build one of these in a minor settlement. Some of these minor settlements will be ports. So a port will take up one slot and a port uh, gives you food, gives you resources, gives you growth, gives you um, gives you a bunch of benefits, of an basically. And, and in some cases, also gives you unit recruitment, dependent on the faction you're playing as. For this the main settlement, eight. you have uh, you may have ports if they're a port city. Uh, you may have special buildings, dependent on your faction, and dependent on the territory. Some special buildings depend on the territory. These may give you faction bonuses or unit recruitment, whatever. Then you have military buildings where you obviously get to your military units. Then you have administrative buildings. This is what's going to matter a lot. Uh, you have these all give you various uh, region wide or even like province wide, basically uh, benefits. Some of them can even give you like faction wide benefits. And in the case of, of administrative buildings, the ones you're going to care about early on are going to be the vineyard tree and the chieftain's hall tree. You get agents, you get spies, and you get um, envoys. Envoys help you with influence, spies help you with weakening enemy armies. The, one, the vineyards give you happiness, the chieftain's hall give you influence. And then the final one gives you growth. This brings me to growth, happiness, and influence. Growth, well, the, the way growth works is in order to upgrade a main settlement building to get access to higher level buildings within a region, in a province, um, the way you, that works is you need to accumulate a certain amount of growth, so zero out of 135 in this case, get a, po a population surplus point. So in this case, it would take two turns to get one point, and I need four to get to, to, uh, uh, to get Lycia, basically a main settlement of Lycia to... Uh, level four so it would take quite a few turns to get enough population surplus and once you have that population surplus and the resources you can upgrade your main settlement that's where growth comes in that's why you want to have a very positive growth 
from the start instead of just, I don't know, going to a minor settlement and getting, say, a stone mason's uh, lodge, which reduces your growth. Growth, uh, there are plenty of buildings that increase growth, like the main settlement buildings increase growth in their own right. So what you can do is upgrade your minor, minor settlement buildings first off to level three and then worry about your main settlement buildings or you can save My a lot of growth and just get your main settlement buildings up first to a certain point or a combination of the two. And obviously once you get, you get more building slots, the higher the settlement level is. Uh, and you will also gain access to higher level buildings when it comes to it. Uh, happiness, pretty self-explanatory. If um, taxes uh, take a toll on unhappiness, I think higher difficulties may take a toll on happiness. I, I don't know. This is on normal. It's not uh, taking a toll. So it's like here it's just minus five taxes. I'm getting four from buildings and one from characters. Happiness is important because happiness will dictate, um, like if you get minus 100 happiness, you will get a rebellion and you obviously don't want that to happen. In previous Total War games, it was actually quite annoying to deal with happiness because it was so easy to get constant rebellions. With Free Kingdoms and with this title, they've reduced that, so you won't have it as as con you won't have to deal with constant rebellions, which was pretty annoying to deal with in previous Total War games. But you also have to deal with influence this time around. So influence, uh, it's basically dictated by buildings or research or characters. And influence gives you certain bonuses. Like for instance, if I have a high influence with uh, in this region, which I do, I gain five more resources. But this goes higher. So at level two, it's from 36 to 45. At level three, stone miners houses it goes from 48 to 60 but that's just one example what about the small mountain well with high influence i would get from 40 to 56 69 to 104 and then finally 98 to 144 if i have high influence so high influence does matter uh, for resources it does have a significant impact when it comes to uh to, to your resource collection not for all buildings but uh, enough that it, it is something that you should uh, you should care about like basically buildings with high influence bonus provide additional resources if influence in the province is 60% or above that's how it goes so that's basically all you need to know really when it comes to unit production on top of that each province also has commandments if you control the entire thing or if you have vassals that's only for Agamemnon since he's the only one that can have vassals and these commandments go from Resource benefits, agent bonuses, happiness bonus, uh, construction costs, administration efficiency. Okay, so that's kind of really all you really need to know to get started for this. Uh, my recommendation is focus on resources. You will need a lot. Maybe get some military production, though not all of it. You want to balance for the main settlement. You want to balance between military production and all the bonuses you can get from building. So, for instance... In a settlement where you might have low happiness, you absolutely want to get the vineyard. Where you have low influence, you want to get the chieftain's hall. Where you want growth, you can get um, houses, you know, better, better houses. Okay. Now, as for war and diplomacy. Well, you will always have an enemy army at the start of, of the game, a raid against you. You can fight the battles manually or you can auto-resolve. There are situations where you might want to auto-resolve. There are situations where you might want to fight them on your own. Now, generally, I personally find, and this is my view, when it comes to fighting battles, there are a lot of cases where you want to want to resolve. And the reason is that you will get more of a reasonable experience spread along all of your units. The catch is, auto resolve generally can result in much higher casualties if you're someone who knows what they're doing in battle, how to play it. You can get much lower casualties in a battle by playing it manually, but you will have a skewed experience gain. So if you want to have a veteran army, a completely veteran army, then you may want to fight to out-resolve a lot of the easier battles so that all of your units can get experience. Once a battle is won, you have various options. You can um, banter the units away. This will give you some resources. I don't think this is worth it in Troy so far. Maybe they can benefit that, uh, increase that bonus down the line but it's just a trickle of food and i've never seen it being worth it you can kill them for a morale bonus which i don't know plus eight percent morale of all units for two turns that's 
doesn't seem worth it, or you can let them go, and this will replenish Make your units. Them our slaves. Or, sorry, take them on, basically. And that will replenish Storm your challenge. units. So after a battle, you can replenish your units um, by taking the enemy units on. Then we have uh, recruitment. Victory. Outside of Menelaus, who can have global recruitment, you need to recruit units in a province that you own, that you have certain buildings for. Here I'm going to get uh, two units of axe warriors, which are basic melee infantry, and light skirmishers. Now, when it comes to which units you should recruit, um, that's, that depends on each faction. So as Sarpedon, you start with these axe warriors, like you have different unit classes, uh, and there is a basic unit, so Anatolian youths are, and light skirmishers are like the basic units that you get from, from just having a settlement. And the Anatolian youths are something you can recruit even from a minor level one Stop settlement. So they're the weakest yeah. units. Then you have to consider like uh, shielded units versus unshielded units. Like shielded units will take a lot of punishment from range units. They'll be able to withstand it very, very well. And that's something you may want to concern yourself with when playing this, this particular be game. A good discussion. But here, what I actually really want are chariots. Maybe not a lot of them, since I can't really afford them, but I'm missing food, right? In this particular case. Well, how do I solve that? Well, there are different resources, resource types, and you can trade it away. You start with non-aggression pacts with all of Troy, basically. And other neighbors don't really hate you with either. Is a so, great idea. what you can do, pretty quickly, is you can Negotiating with King make some is deals great idea. for resources. And this is where I get into explaining what diplomacy. Can I do? So, Break out uh, the at the most basic point, talk. you can get non-aggression packs, military access, and then later on, defensive alliance, military alliance, confederation. Right? Confederation basically adds a faction to yours. This is not necessarily the wisest move to do because confederating a faction will give you all of their land and all of their troops, but it won't give you their resources. So you may want to have a trading partner, especially if you're playing someone like Hector who benefits from having allies. You may want to have a trading partner and a military ally who can actually, who has his own armies, his own economies, can maintain a lot more troops and more armies than just confederating them. Though it's not exactly easy to confederate with a faction, unless it's something special, like Hector or Paris will confederate with Troy and with the other brother once they are in Priam's favor. But anyway, uh, so in this case with uh, Palawa, I can get a non-aggression pact and military access, and this gives me, the way diplomacy works is each deal has a rating, right? So in this case, for doing that, I get 20 4.6 uh, value of the deal plus 24.6 but I then I can get a barter agreement or a single barter basically a trade for resources or a trade agreement over multiple turns for resources now in this case I need wood and I need food so I'm going to ask for both I need wood for buildings and I need food for the chariots well that and now I have an agreement. This will improve relations with them. So you can see that this improves relations. Break, breaking agreements, you can break agreements. For instance, if I I'm go here, I can cancel the agreement I just made. But this will impact my relation with this faction. And not just with this faction, but also with all of his friends, all the factions that are friendly with him. And since this is just a deal that I just signed, it would impact my... Uh, reliability rating. So your reliability rating is how everyone sees you, basically. If you have this low, this will affect each value, uh, the value of each deal. So in this case, I would lose a lot of reliability rating if I canceled this non-aggression pact with them. Or if I did something even worse and I declared war against them despite the fact that I have a non-aggression pact with them. So before signing military access pacts and non-aggression pacts, alliances, all that kind of stuff, be careful about that. It's, be careful about that because it's a two-way stream. Maybe you sign a non-aggression pact or a military access pact with someone 
and then they're allied with another faction that you want to go to war with, or one of your allies gets into a war with, and they request that you join. That's a no-win situation. Because when you have a military ally, when you have a military alliance, if someone declares wars, a war against another faction, then you can join, then you either have to join or you can decline and break the alliance. So you lose the military alliance with that other faction. You may not want to break that, King especially Sopidin if you sign such an agreement recently. Case. Now, when it comes to making deals, in many Total War games, I'd recommend making deals on the very first turn. You know, get the trade agreements that you can, get diplomatic status that you can because you do because uh, you'll always start like a neutral situation in this game it's if a good draw... idea to wait at least one turn why because you can squeeze the ai for resources Son for those kind of agreements himself. so in this case i just got enough food to buy another chariot i could actually get another one i could get three if i <laughs> i could get an extra chariot if i so desired but i need a they're more food, don't I, I? keep my promises. I don't know. In this case, I actually need... I, uh, my bad. I need wood. <laughs> I was looking at the wrong icon. Okay, so I need wood. I need a bit more wood to make... Uh, to make that. So I'm just I going to go with military access, and I'm going to that. ask them for, let's say, 300 wood. And since I have some bronze that I actually don't need, I'm going to trade some of that. Some of that away for that wood. Make that agreement, good. Yeah, sorry, chariots do cost, but I was looking, I was really seeing the wrong icon. Okay, need just a bit more uh, wood over there. Well, we have these two that do have a reasonable amount of wood. We also have Hector, who also I have has nothing a but respect for the Lord of the In this case, I just need, let's see, 150, 50 stone bit more trade it for that okay and i can recruit three units of chariots <laughs> uh, i can have three units of chariots i don't have enough gold to recruit three units but i uh, can get three units All total my beauty. and i end the turn before you end the turn there are certain things you may want to do like this is the camera settings and you can watch the movement of ai factions be it allies neutral or enemies so in my case though i prefer to turn it on you have various um settings like cinematic low medium high strategic right you may want to go strategic or high so it's not quite as annoying personally i just prefer to turn it off because you can always see what ai is doing at after it's ended its turn or maybe you miss a certain actions sure fair enough but for the most part you'll be fine just sending it up to off Unless you miss an AI faction moving an army through your territory and you didn't spot it because you were looking on the other side of the map. And then you get ambushed. That's something, that is a situation where you might uh, want uh, to have it on. Now here Indeed. I'll just get one more chariot, two more of these guys, and I'll start also upgrading, getting some building upgrades. And with that, I'll also end this turn. But first, I let's see about making some deals. We with could Troy. both come out of this better off. Military access. Actually, I'll wait with that, and instead, I'll ask for food. Since they'll give it to me for that military alliance. Sharp, but... Troy won't. The words of Lysia's king are always welcome. Then we have Dardania. Okay, let's wait a bit with that. Ask for stone. Ask for a thousand food. And you can ask for a bunch of resources, basically, if you have a favorable agreement. Now, this is cheesing the system, but this is something you're going to have to get used to. The AI has more... Like, this is kind of, I guess, the problem of Total War. The AI has more resources than you do. I know and I this is on normal difficulty. It's not veteran or anything like that, right? Uh, so the AI will always have more resources than you will. And you have to deal with that. You can abuse that. You can take advantage of that situation. The AI will also get settlements We've got to a to higher level easier than you will. 
King Sarpedon is well. And they will have other advantages as well. I am open to King Sarpedon's words. Okay, in this case, just a thousand. Maybe that was a bit too much, wasn't it? Okay, just a bunch of wood. I'll wait with the. I am open. I'll wait another Sa turn so they get more resources. You don't necessarily want to make these kind of agreements with everyone, but like an example. Uh, these guys, the Pelagians, they start We've got plenty with the non-aggression pact with Hector in Paris, so they're a good faction to actually make a deal with, as an example. And that's how you can get a lot of resources. And this is, by the way, one yes, of the reasons why Sarpedon is so powerful, by the way, because they can get all of these agreements on turn one. All of these alliances, defensive alliances, all that kind of stuff. You can also trade territory if a faction is next to you. You can break. You can ask them to break non-aggression packs, all that kind of stuff. In this case, I'll just want a thousand food, since I know you have it. We have much. Lots of agreements were reached. So I have alliances with Troy. I see it was an ally of Troy, and it did support them in their war. Now, in this case, I can get another building. And what do I want? Well, let's say a temple, an altar of Aphrodite, and then a vineyard, so I can get the spy. Putting all those resources to use that I've cover, uh, that I've gained, getting builder quarters, and that will be King pretty much Sarpedon. it. And that's why Sarpedon, by the way, is so easier to manage. Then you have missions to worry about. These regular missions will just give you small bonuses for doing certain things like capturing certain territories, maintaining an army size, those kind of things. Agreed. Now, I need to be careful about the upkeep. You don't want to go over the upkeep. Though you can always make a barter agreement. Say, hey, I'm earning a thousand food. Give me like, I don't know, 500 bronze per turn. Very few factions will make that deal, but that's just an, an idea. So here, I just need more uh, more units. So I have muster troops, issue a royal decree, which is in progress, and construct any buildings. Now. You, I have some unoccupied settlements. You generally may encounter these when a faction raises a settlement to the ground. And this is this is something where you can use uh, hero recruitment to uh, uh, to resell a, a settlement. So in this case, this province of Lycia is missing Mabola. So what I can do and what I should do is get a hero and send them Veteran over there to resell. Just a hero. You just recruit a hero. Now, when it comes to hero recruitment, what's important to understand is their motivation. They're, they have obviously the type of hero that you're, you've got, like defenders, archers, all that kind of stuff. Like that's important, right? Warlords, uh, all that kind of stuff is important. But what you're also going to be concerned about is their motivation. Each hero has a motivation, and each hero has different ways of gaining that motivation. So in this case, it's motivation. He gains motivation. He's valorous, so he gains motivation if uh, turn ends and Athena is respected by this faction. One motivation per turn. It can go all the way up to ten. Uh, you can gain... Uh, and you can gain basically a movement speed bonus, morale uh, bonus, and a rage bonus, which I'll get to, into when we get into a battle. Um, he loses motivation and gets, gets negatives to happiness, all that kind of stuff, uh, in a province, morale, rage. Uh, if in this case, in his case, if he loses battle, if the or if this uh, this hero ends turn in an old province with a negative population. Right, a negative population. Now, I admit, I don't quite know what a negative population is, what that means exactly. I'll, 
I'll freely admit that. Is it Veteran growth? Strategist. I guess. Yeah, I guess it could be growth, right? It could indicate growth. I see so the it might picture. just indicate growth, really. But I'm not entirely Son certain 100% with respect to that. It's one of those things that... I, Battle warms the blood. That maybe it's best re to read uh, the wiki on. But yeah, every hero has his own things. Every hero has his own uh, his own type of motivation. In this case, I'm just going to send him here to reclaim this particular settlement. As for uh, Sarpadon, well, he is going to get more units. Understood. And then he's going to march on Rhodes. You probably want to get a full stack army early on. Before doing anything else. Now, I'll also whisper a, a prayer to... And I, I, I'll get uh, at least... This yeah, I'll get 17 hit. units and then I'll move on. And then I'll, uh, I'll also they pray to Poseidon to get deep sea attrition benefits. Wise in war. Leave none alive. A true ally. Probably should have moved them actually before this turn. But yeah, we have uh oh. we have Rhodes here. We depart. Rhodes has some minor settlements, two minor settlements, and a major settlement in the province. So going to upgrade this Sanctuary of Aphrodite, or maybe just wait. Let's see how much resources it will take to get Mobola back up and running. Now, the AI will eventually get the, these kind of settlements, these abandoned settlements on their own, so you actually want to get these yourself. If you get the right a settlement like this, you'll just have a ruined farm settlement, you'll have to upgrade it, you'll have to spend resources. In this case, I'll just get the resource commandment and keep moving Sarpedon over here. Now, this is the deep sea. Like, basically, everything outside of the coast is considered the deep sea. So, you would have taken attrition if I didn't have the benefit there from, uh, from Poseidon. I have nothing but respect for the Lord of the Lycians. Yes. It would please me to speak with you. I am sure there is much to discuss. Break out the good wine and let's talk. There is much to discuss. What can I do for King Sun? Will? So I've basically gotten a bunch of agreements. Now, Sarpedon does have a unique, fa a unique faction mechanic, or rather two faction mechanics. One of which is um, precious resources, the distributor resources. This is pretty easy to understand. He's got a bunch of unique resources that are found in pretty much every province in small quantities. So, for instance, Lycia itself has white granite uh, and other regions, depending on what you're talking about. But you actually need a settlement to, to see this. Other regions may will, will have other resources to uh, that they can bring to the table, right? They, they can have. Anyway, if you have enough of these and you actually need 
a certain amount of them in order to win. So you need five, 50, 50, 50, right? 50 Minoan, 50 Celestial, 50 White Granite. But you can also use these press resources to get bonuses. Minus one construction time for all buildings and ciliaries, minus 20% stone construction costs faction wide with White Granite. With Celestial Iron, it's six melee attack to all units on recruitment, six melee defense on uh, recruitment and ancillaries, and then Minoan Relics. 20% favor of the gods from rituals in all settlements, ancillaries, and 12 influence faction wide. Now, this isn't permanent, it is a temporary benefit. How do you get these resources beyond getting certain settlements and building special buildings in certain settlements to get them? Well, you can ask them from factions whom you have influence with. So, for instance, the Carrions, I can, um, since I have some influence with them, right? I have 39% influence. They have a bunch of Celestial Iron. I can just trade away 20 gold for precious resources. Or in the case of roads, I can actually trade 20 for some of that, my, some of those Minoan relics. So I get 20 for five, not too bad. Law of an ancient land. I must decline. Towards the horizon. Now, the. I think I'll take that. Now, the AI will offer you a lot of agreements, but the problem is the AI is not particularly good with those kind of agreements. So, anyway, the AI has moved an army here in this settlement, and now it's time to go to war. Let's fight the battle. I have five ranged chariots, but. Those ranged chariots, those archer chariots, are just basically going to storm them in melee. Chariots are completely broken in the game. It goes down to the way units work. So there's they. this game has poor collision detection, at least right now. This might be fixed in the long term, but it has poor collision detection at the moment. Again, something to be fixed, something that I'm sure that they're going to work on if they're not working on already, because it makes chariots overpowered. So chariots can just run over units. Total War has always had an issue in that. Now, when it comes to actually fighting battles, let us let me explain what's the easiest way. I could go into all the details about flanking, morale, and all that, but basically all units have HP, and they have a certain number of unit models, right? They have attack, damage, all, the, all these kind of stats that you have to worry about. Now, a lot of the time when it comes to Total War, there's a kind of Rock Scissors uh, formula, so like... Spear, inf spear units deal with cavalry, and yes, there is cavalry, and they should technically stand up to chariots, but because of poor collision, they don't. But spear units uh, and shielded units in general are really good at holding the line. Uh, whereas other units, like sword units, uh, or axe units in this case, are good at breaking lines. Especially two-handed axe units, these guys. These guys also are good uh, at charger, so this guy has a charger. There are a bunch of units, they all have their own benefits, right? So, for instance, these guys have a good attack, the Axe Warriors have a good attack, they're shielded, so they can take a lot of range fire. They can do a decent job at holding the line, though not quite as good necessarily as the Spears. But they're pretty, pretty solid. Then you have your ranged units. Your Slingers, your Archers, your Javelins. Slingers are, uh, are really good against other Messile units. Archers are decent in their own role, but archers more so are good against light units. And javelins, they are short range, but do a lot of damage. So slingers probably do the least amount of damage. Archers do medium damage with medium range. Um, and then um, javelins have the shortest range, but do the most damage. That's what you need to understand. You can have an entire army of javelins and they can destroy everything in their path if you can control them correctly. Now, uh, when it comes to fighting a battle, like, you have to worry about formations. The way the gameplay works in Total War is that you really want to keep an army together for the most part. 
with so some exceptions do exist, but for the most part we want to keep them together for the sake of morale purposes. Choke points are also really important, in this case there are several choke points in the settlement. Um, it would be very easy for a defender, if, you, if I try to rush my entire army down one of these single choke points in a normal situation, they'd be able to beat it easily. So instead, you in a if you're an attacker in a siege, you want to split your army, and to some extent, though not to split, because you want to keep your units together for morale purposes. Uh, you want to split your army to some extent, uh, and attack from multiple ways if you can afford to do that. If you have a large enough army to do so, and you want to break through at some point. Heroes in this particular title are good at one thing and one thing alone, really. They're good at fighting other heroes. The damage they do to armies is not something like Warhammer or Free Kingdoms. or It's just basically their duelists for the most part. Some are better at the, Or they can also buff units around them, but they're not going to rack up an insane number of kills in battle. Just something for people to be aware of. So here I'm sp splitting my units. Not moving the chariots yet. Right, so because I want to demonstrate what's going to happen here. So here he's put position unit spears, another unit of spearmen, a unit of militia, unit of spearmen. Like he's basically got gotten all the entrances covered. And I'm marching down all of them at the same time. Now I could decide to just march on some of them and leave the others and leave the others. Like I'm not going to attack here. I'm also not going to attack these spears. Each garrison will have its own hero. Now, the way heroes work is they have a rage bar, and using you can use that rage for special abilities. Then you also have another uh, thing to worry about, and that's uh, Aristia. Aristia is a temporary buff that gives you a significant bonus to your hero. So no cooldowns and abilities, 25 uh, hit points heal, 20 armor, 20% armor, 30% melee attack, freeze the stamina, unbreakable, so they won't run from battle. Like. Battles aren't about killing units, it's about breaking their morale, most of the time. Very rare, rarely will you have a battle where it's won purely by killing the enemy units. Most of the time it's won by breaking their morale. Now in this case, I've built my army around one single unit, and that's chariots. So they'll come in here and they'll smash them to pieces. Because my Axemen certainly aren't capable of doing that. If it was just a question of the infantry, I would lose. And this is where you'll get the taste of how broken these guys are. So just keep in mind, these are spearmen, both of them. Like, yeah, the militia are crap units, but they're still spearmen, which are supposed to be a counter to that. And yet, I am marching through and doing damage. And doing a lot of morale damage at the same time as well. Now these are archer chariots, so they're not quite as good at this as some of the heavier chariots are. But they're still capable of bl blowing through his front line. That's why Lycia is so overpowered. Is this abusing the game? Yes, it absolutely is. Is it broken and imbalanced? Yes, it is. Welcome to Total War. It's like this. It's always been like this. It's one of the biggest issues with the series, actually. The Creative Assembly can't do balance for crap. Okay, they're, they're broken. They've tried. They've tried really hard in some titles. Total, uh, Warhammer, for instance. They've never really quite succeeded. Actually, I think in Warhammer, they've just basically given up at trying to balance things, and it's like, yeah, how broken can we make certain things versus others? Now, the idea is supposed to be with cavalry charges, right? And flanking attacks in general. Like, it's, like in this case, it's a siege battle, so, like, everyone's, you know, he's covered all the entrances, so it's hard to really show this, but the idea is... You want the front line to engage the enemy, and then you want 
a flanking force to hit them from the side. Or you abuse archer units and kill them before they even get to you. There's a lot of things that go into a total war bat that can go into a you total war battle and some point. things you just need to learn on your own. But importantly, a lot of the time when it comes to these battles, what I've personally done for years is I form my army in kind of like, I'm just going to pull my guys back, like I form my army in something like this. I put, in this case, I put the axemen in the center, spears on the side, both sides even. Some reserve units if I want them, and ranged units in the second one. That's your basic total war formation, uh, one army of your formation. Units has no more ammunition. With cavalry on the flanks. You can concentrate cavalry if you so desire. You can split them between them in order to make the most use of them. But a lot, of, a lot of the time, just that simple formation is going to be extremely effective at dealing with pretty much anything that comes your way. In fact, most of the time in Total War, it really lives up to to the ideas of Sun Tzu. It's like battles are won before they even begin a lot of the time in this series. Like if you ever get yourself into a battle where, which you actually have to fight and put a lot of effort in, like outside of the auto result being broken, like if you actually have a challenging battle on the battlefield, then you've done something wrong on the campaign map or the opponent has, your AI has gotten the upper hand against you in some way. Most of the time, battles should, the outcome of battles should already be predetermined if you know what you're doing, if you know what kind of fights you're getting into. Like in this fight, for instance, I know for certain that I'm going to win. In fact, I've already won the battle. <laughs> I knew well in advance that I was going to win. Now, sure, partly this was because of chariots, but even if I didn't have chariots, what would I do if I didn't have chariots? Well, I wouldn't assault the settlement, but I would siege them, in which case they would have a choice. They could either fight me in an open field battle, which I'd win because I have the superior force, or they could take the siege and then get destroyed. Maybe they could wait that out, get reinforcements, but that would be unlikely to happen. And that's victory. An important thing to know about siege battles in particular is that if you fight a battle on the open field, an army can retreat, right, in a group. If you fight an, an army in a siege battle, then that army gets destroyed if you win. Same if you're on the defense. If you fight a battle, a siege battle on the defense and you lose, you lose the entire force. But on the open field, you might be able to retreat. And indeed, now you won't be able to retreat tr twice with an army on the open field. You can retreat once unless you're in forced march, in which case you can't retreat at all. So it can be a valuable ah, tactic so to fight the battle, then re then lose it, so to speak, but get away from it with all of your units intact, or most of your units intact, having done some damage to the enemy, and then fight the second battle where you completely crush them. If the AI is even foolish enough to attack you in the I second would. battle to begin with. Now, Sarpedon has leveled. Uh, there are plenty of skills to worry about. Most of, many of them are passive abilities. Some of them are active abilities. What you go for depends honestly on your preference. I would avoid some of the defensive skills. Like for instance, this, uh, this one gives you uh, 20 armor to allies in range, 25 armor to allies in range, which is quite a bit, but reduces their speed by 60%. Not quite the ideal situation for someone who's going to focus a lot on chariots, right? This is what his faction is about. This is what he gets bonuses on. So going for that, may, maybe not the best idea in the world, right? Instead, I'll go for Seize the Moment, which affects enemies in range and lowers their defense by 50%. So you have skills that go after heroes or target a single unit. You have skills that target enemy units. You have skills that buff your army as a whole or certain units that you target. You have skills that benefit your hero in duels. Honor give them passive benefits, so HP, movement speed, all that kind of stuff. You have also skills that give a hero a chariot. Mm, like this one, combat mastery versus a chariot. Well, I know what I'm gonna pick. So 
So, with that fought and won, I have pretty wolf much wolf destroyed the principal damage. enemy force in this region, and I can go march on their capital. Well, that's a reasonable amount of resources, I feel. Okay, my ally wants me to join them, fair enough. Lord of an ancient land. Now, when it comes to sieges, proper sieges against walled settlements, I would recommend many times to avoid actually fighting these kind of battles yourself, especially if there is a strong army in there, because it's very easy to lose them. You can either out resolve it if you feel the cost is worth paying, or you can wait until they run out of food, in this case in four turns, and they'll do then they'll start, start suffering attrition. So their unit strength is going to go down, they'll lose uh, models, basically soldiers in these units, and then you can just uh, resolve it, win it easily, or fight it on your own. Most of the time, those sieges are not worth actually fighting, and it's either starving them or auto-resolving the battle. In this case, I'll auto-resolve it. By the way, I like that he has like either a bronze axe or a gold-tinted one. So I've lost two chariots there. The city but that's belongs fine. to us. Steadfast. In this case, I'll actually get javelin men and uh, destroy that unit production. This leaves them with one final settlement. In this case, I'm gonna get food. You want to prioritize food? That's actually gonna be the resource you're gonna struggle with the most. Each army. By the way, since I have a second army here, each army adds to your upkeep. So if you recruit a hero, it will tell you this. Each additional hero recruited will increase your total army upkeep by 1% bronze and 22% food. So in this case, it would increase by 1 bronze and 400 food. Just something to be aware of. I serve without that question. the more armies you have, the more your economy suffers just by default. It's what you'd call a supply line. It's been called supply line in some other games. That's something to worry about if you're playing in this style. So you are limited in how many armies you can have. Now here I have an, a choice between attrish, uh, attrition or treasures looted after battle. So I'll go for treasures looted after battle and I'll keep upgrading settlements and I'll then get an agent to spy. When it comes to agents, they give you various bonuses for your army and also against the AI. So in this case, spies as an example. If you attach them to an army and you can attach every agent to an army, he will um, he'll increase the sight range of the army. If he's standing passive, he'll reduce the chance of enemy agent actions in a region. If you use him on your own settlement to increase the replenishment of the garrison. If you use it against a foreign settlement, this will cause their garrison attrition, uh, attrition, so you can use a spy to significantly weaken the defensive force of an enemy settlement and then attack it. Uh, you can't do this, by the way, on a settlement that's under siege, so you want to do it before putting it under siege, uh, before attacking, uh, and certainly before attacking it. Then you have assassinating, uh, so you can assassinate an enemy rival, be it an enemy agent or um, enemy hero, and then you have poison the well which will cause enemy armies, not garrisons, so they're separate things. An army can be inside the settlement, but you have to target them separately. And you only get one of these actions per turn. Heroes also have various bonuses, so like line of sight, success chance. Success chance is, is, is a reasonable one. You are limited in the number of agents that you can have, so here I can only have one spy. I can also get the priestess. Uh, priestesses will give you, can give you some favor uh, with, um, like, uh, priestesses can give you happiness if they're standing passively. They can give you favor with a particular god. Uh, they can reduce the morale of enemy units. And then they can do a bunch of other things. Then you have epic agents like, uh, like the Gorgons, the Satyrs, and the Seers, but these require favor of the gods. Those are a bit more special. And envoys, like, priestesses help you out with religion, spies help you out dealing with enemy characters or enemy armies, and envoys 
What they help you out is they give you influence and they also uh, reduce, they can reduce the army upkeep of one of your forces. So you can attach them to an army and reduce the upkeep costs in that uh, force. Now, uh, and I feel like that's pretty much a good starting point for anyone that wants to get into it. But there is a final thing that I do want to touch on. And that's a cheese you can do. There's a lot of cheeses uh, tactics that you can absolutely do in this title. Uh, but one of the more powerful ones is the following. And this is something that you absolutely should take advantage of because it is certainly a benefit, especially on higher difficulties. So you fight a battle against an enemy settlement. It's the last settlement they have that this particular AI faction has, right? I lose some units here, whatever, that's not important. Then I sack the settlement. I treasure. sack, I don't take it, Lord, I don't occupy it, land. I go away, I come back, I'll end the turn here, and I sack it again. And again. And again. <laughs> and again. You get the idea. Now, keep in mind, there is a price of this. Every time you do that, it will affect happiness in the region. So you might have a rebellion. But do you care? Given what you're getting out of all of this. You may not care. Now, here I'm not going to do anything because I just spent resources uh, foolishly. So I'm just going to wait. Cancel that, then colonize. So you, so you can ta adv take advantage of this. What's the main advantage? Leveling your heroes. Yeah. You can get heroes to a ridiculously high level, get all of their abilities unlocked, or a significant portion of their abilities unlocked. And... Uh, And even get experience for your troops. But really, it's leveling your heroes that will get will be the biggest benefit out of this. So, Son of Zeus. so I go back there. Back. They've gotten one unit. Their they garrison hasn't the really recovered. I just thought to resolve. I win the battle. I get 500 experience, which is actually quite a reasonable amount. I get some food. I get some gold. And then I sack it. I don't gain anything out of this. Take it all. Out of the Amazing. sacking process itself. But because I won a battle, I got some experience. So Sarpedon has gained a level. And you can keep doing this over and over and over again. There is a price. So you may want to do it on an, a completely hostile enemy province, abusing this. But you can do it continuously, and you can benefit from this we have increased our holdings. to quite a significant amount. And this is one of the many, many cheeses that you can use. Another one in I battle, you can hide boss. in a corner, or you can send a unit in advance, like a chariot, uh, preferably a mobile unit to soak up uh, that can take quite a bit of damage, like a hero on a chariot. You could send him ahead of the army. You can soak up a lot of range fire, expand the enemy anim uh, ammunition. This is something that works especially well in Warhammer 2, but it can also work in this game. So you can waste the enemy's ammunition before they engage in battle against you. I can and by the way, battles are also time limited. So if you're playing on the defensive, if you're on the offensive, yeah, that's a different affair. But if you're on the defensive, then you can just make the AI waste its time while you just run around the entire battlefield and you can absolutely do that. There's a lot of tactics like that. Anyway, Christine here on Serious Gaming signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.